Welcome, everybody, for our first conference. Um, my name is Joost Keerts. I'm a board member of SOC21, which is an English socialist research collective for socialism in the 21st century. Before we start dealing with solidarity and inequality, let me brief you, briefly introduce you SOC21. SOC 21 has been established late last year and aimed to foster in-depth research on well-founded visions on the connections between all relevant political themes and their elaboration at the practical level that can aid activists and social movements go hand in hand. The aim is to contribute to the development of knowledge for and with social movements based on international solidarity, feminism, and eco-socialism. Eco the full declaration of our founding can be found on the website. Though our first interest is to stimulate the low level of debate in the Netherlands, where, as the German poet Heinrich Heine said so, everything is happening 50 years later, we cannot do so in isolation. The Netherlands are an integrated part of modern world white neoliberalism. Hence, I'm very proud that it can inform you that our first international conference, which you presently attend, knows roughly 90 registered participants from a great many countries. Please visit our website for other projects. And even more important, consider us as a serious partner in your own endeavors. Before I give Marcel the floor to introduce the subject of the matter of today, I would like to introduce you our co-organizer, Herman Peterson, as a Dutch historian with a keen interest in economic long wave theory, who is the secretary of the board and will deal with the structuring of the discussion. And also our chief technology officer, as it is called nowadays, Jeremy Krollsmith, who enabled the technology today and who will give a quick explanation of the Zoom procedures shortly. Given the restraints of a meeting where six sevenths of the participants are not in the room, we have to be very strict in our programming and time schedule. Please realize that we strive to have a serious discussion among all of us and not a grilling of the speakers and commentators in a simple Q&A session. The people in this room are requested to ensure adherence to COVID-19 protocol. Coffee, tea, as well as toilets are in the lounge next door. Now I will ask Jeremy to quickly review the use of Zoom and the way you can post questions and discussion points. Herman and Marcel and I will follow this in suggestion order and participation and answering. So first, the floor is to Jeremy. Hello, everyone. I'm just getting my microphone set up. So, uh, hi, I'm, I'm Jeremy. I'll be uh, trying to do the technology uh, to, today a bit better than you might be seeing me fiddling with my microphone. Um, so I just want to um, uh, explain how you can participate uh, today uh, as an attendee. Will be, uh, there will be several presentations and uh, held by uh, the panelists. Uh, we will be able to see on your screen. Uh, as an as a attendee, as a watching, watching from home, uh, you can participate um, during the Q&A sessions uh, in which you can make your own comments and ask questions. Um, how this will work is that you can um, pose questions via uh, the uh, Q&A tab. On the bottom of your screen uh, in Zoom, you will find a, uh, a button which says Q&A. Uh, if you click that during the Q&A uh, session, you can then uh, type uh, your comment or your question. Um, Herman, who, uh, who will uh, present himself later on, will then uh, make a selection of the questions and he will contact you and ask if you would like to uh, participate uh, with your audio and video on and then we'll uh, activate your uh, your screen uh, together with you and then you can uh, then you can participate uh, live uh, uh, on the internet as well 
So this, uh, this will be um, repeated again when we get to the Q&A se uh, session. So don't worry if you, uh, you were confused. It will become uh, clear uh, um, at that point. Um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's it uh, from me uh, for now. Uh, we might be uh, using the, we'll also be using the, um, the chat function, which is separate from the Q&A. So please keep that open as well. Um, you can also find the chat button uh, on your Zoom screen at the, at the, bottom, uh, at the bottom of the Zoom. Um, we'll use this to communicate with you if you have any uh, uh, just general questions about the proceedings. Uh, you can uh, ask them um, to, the, uh, to me. Uh, I'm SOC21 um, on, the, uh, on the chat screen. And then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try and answer all your questions. So, um, yeah, for now, that's, uh, that's it. That's it okay. for me. And I think I'll pass it on to Marcel, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Marcel van der Linden. I'm happy to welcome you all uh, at this first conference of uh, the SOC21 Foundation. And we will start uh, as this whole uh, project of the, the foundation with a very important topic, international solidarity and the problems it uh, confronts, uh, has to confront uh, in relation to uh, global inequality within the world working class. The global economy, as we all know, is increasingly reliant on collaboration among workers who do not know each other and who are not even aware of each other's existence. But the transnationalization of labor processes, which started gradually in the 1960s and accelerated since the 1980s, has been crucial in this process. As a result, goods manufactured in one country are increasingly uh, assembled from components produced in other countries, which in turn contain subcomponents made in still other countries. This process, also known as slicing up or unbundling of supply chains, started at about the same time in North America with twin plants in Mexico and the United States and in East Asia. And then it was followed somewhat later by Europe, where Spain and Portugal joined the European Union in 1986 and where East European so-called socialism collapsed in the early 90s. Transnationalization has had sweeping consequences for the world working class. First, a growing share of employees as part of global supply chains. The International Labour Organization's World Economic and Social Outlook uh, has estimated that in 40 countries, I quote, in 40 countries representing 85% of world gross domestic product and covering approximately two thirds of the global labor force, the number of global supply chain related jobs increased by 157 million or 53% between 95 and 2013, resulting in a total of 453 million global supply chain related jobs in 2013. This already in 2013 equaled one quarter of the world's employees. While transnationalization has greatly boosted industrialization in the global south, the jobs created are largely unskilled and substandard and increasingly, especially in the global south, performed by women. I quote from a report of the International Trade Union Confederation, the ITUC. 80% of world trade and 60% of global production is now captured by the supply chains of multinational companies. The majority of supply chain workers are trapped in insecure and often unsafe jobs with poverty wages and long hours. Informal work, forced overtime and slavery are also found in this mix. A recent ITUC report shows, this is the ITC, ITUC quoting itself, shows that 50 of the world's largest companies directly employ just 6% of the workers in their supply chains. The remaining 94% are part of the hidden workforce of global production. End of quote. Very occasionally, we are given a glimpse of that interconnectedness, as in 2013, when the collapse of Rana Plaza in Bangladesh gave us a chilling reminder that much clothing is produced in appalling conditions by women and children, and men, of course, in poor countries. Generally, however, we do not dwell on such global connections. 
but more and more social scientists and historians nowadays want to understand them. Wage earners in the global north can buy t-shirts so cheaply because their real wages are much higher than the wages of laborers in the global south, as we all know. In that sense, workers in the north benefit from the exploitation of workers in the south. This is what we have tentatively, tentatively called a relational inequality within the world working class. Our present workshop will attempt a first exploration of this global inequality. We expect to focus on its causes and its economic, social, and political consequences. We are fortunate to have three main speakers who in recent years have contributed significantly, or in fact four speakers, uh, to our insight in relational inequalities. We start with a presentation by uh, Markus Wissen and Uli Brandt. Uh, Uli teaches political science at the University of Vienna, while Marcus teaches economics at the Berlin School of Economics and Law. In a number of important joint publications, they have introduced the concept of the imperial mode of living. As they will explain more extensively in a minute, they argue that this concept helps us to better understand uh, the persistence, the spread, and the contradictions of unsustainable patterns of production and consumption. Those patterns are based on a gigantic appropriation of the resources and labor power of both the global north and the global south, and of a disproportionate claim to global sinks like forests and oceans in the case of CO2. Uh, CO2 sorry. The imperial mode of living means a good living for parts of humanity at the cost of others, which means it restricts the opportunities for a decent life for many. After the presentation of uh, Marcus and Uli, there will be some comments by Lucas Poi. Lucas is replacing Rosanna Baragan, who is recovering from illness and therefore could not join the workshop. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, Lucas is an Argentinian labor historian. His second book, El Partido Socialista Argentino, Una Historia Social y Política, was just published in Santiago de Chile. Our second main speaker, well, in fact, the third, is uh, John Smith, the author of the much praised book uh, Imperialism in the 21st Century that was published in 2016 by Monthly Review Press and was the winner of the first Paul Barron, Paul Sweezy Memorial Award. John has been an oil rig worker, bus driver, telecommunications engineer, and is a longtime activist in the anti-war and Latin American solidarity movements. Today, he will use the framework developed in his book to offer some critical considerations on the notion of relational inequality by expanding and refining the concept and in the end by arguing that relational inequality is apartheid, unfortunately a Dutch word originally, on a global scale. An important element in John's contribution is the concept of super exploitation, which is already present in Marx's capital but has gained much more attention in recent decades thanks to the writings of Louis Maru Marini and Andy Higginbottom. Uh, Rui Maru Marini died 23 years ago, but Andy Higginbotten is still very much alive and will join uh, our workshop, we hope. Kaveh Yazdani will comment on John's contribution. Kaveh teaches economic history at the University of Bielefeld. Earlier, he worked in Johannesburg, Warwick, and here in Amsterdam. Kaveh's major publication is India, Modernity and the Great Divergence, published in 2017. And if I say major publication, I also mean a book of more than 700 pages. Our third main speaker is Ben Selwyn. For Corona reasons, Ben will join us through Zoom. Ben teaches political economy at the School of Global Studies in Brighton. His many publications include Worker State and Development in Brazil, the global development crisis and the struggle for development. Today, Ben will focus on the importance of global value chains for the understanding of relational inequality and the imperial mode of living. He argues that the concept of super exploitation is essential for understanding these processes and very important that super exploitation is not only happening in the global south, but also in part of the global north. Kwame Nimako will comment on Ben's contribution. Kwame is well known here at the IIRE because he has been organizing a series of summer schools on black Europe in this building since, I believe, 2007. 
Uh, Kwame has taught at the universities of Amsterdam and Berkeley and many publications to his name. I mentioned two books, Economic Change and Political Conflict in Ghana, 1600-1990, uh, which is also his doctoral thesis, and The Dutch Atlantic Slavery, Abolition and Emancipation of 2011, which he wrote together with the late Glenn Willems. Each presentation will, of course, be followed by a plenary discussion in which both the participants physically present or attending through Zoom can join, as was just explained by Joost, and will be repeated at every round of our discussion. At the end of the day, We'll have one more general discussion, which will hopefully indicate directions for further research and discussion in the near future. Thank you. And now give the floor to Marcus.